So let's talk about managing anticoagulation and thrombosis remotely. We're going to use a case-based uh, approach. Uh, our, our next case um, is about switching from warfarin to a direct-acting oral anticoagulant. And in this case, we've got a 79-year-old patient who has been receiving long-term treatment with warfarin for atrial fibrillation. And uh, you finally have reached a point where we're going to move her over because we don't want her uh, attending the labs and exposing to COVID-19. So um, uh, how would you uh, deal with this and minimal, uh, how would you approach this, uh, this switch and minimize the amount of uh, laboratory testing that's required? Jim, can I turn this one over to you? Sure. Well, the, one of the key advantages of the DOAX or direct oral anticoagulants has been that they do not require any routine laboratory monitoring as is the case with uh, warfarin. And I think that advantage has become highlighted in this uh, era uh, and going forward. Uh, patients on warfarin often require INR testing every two to four weeks. If their INR is very elevated, they may be sent to the emergency department to receive vitamin K. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think what we want to do right now with this case is just provide the audience and clinicians with a very easy stepwise way to transition your patient from warfarin to a direct oral anticoagulant with as little as just one single test or visit to the lab. So let's go to the next slide. I think it is important to, to obtain a baseline INR in that patient before you make the switch. And the reason is that you want to know what their level of anticoagulation with warfarin is, because that will determine how long you wait before you start the direct oral anticoagulant. And as you know, it, warfarin is a drug that has a very long half-life, so it takes anywhere between four to five or six days for the anticoagulant to effect to recede completely, whereas direct oral anticoagulants work almost immediately after intake. So we want the INR or the anticoagulant effect to be close to normal or near normal when we initiate DOLAC therapy. So if we obtain a baseline INR on our patient, and let's say it's between 2.1 and 3.5, then if we do this on a Monday, then it's pretty safe for us to start that DOLAC on day plus four or on the Friday. Uh, with our knowledge of the pharmacokinetics of warfarin, we're pretty sure that that level is gonna be around 1.5 or less, and that it's safe to start a DOAC uh, on day plus four. On the other hand, if the INR is, is two or less, then we can start the DOAC immediately and not have to uh, delay. Uh, and on the other, further, if the INR is higher, let's say between three and a half to four and a half, we add an extra day before starting uh, the DOAC. And then if the INR is at a point where we get a little bit concerned about the effect on coagulation function, then at that point, it may be reasonable to re recheck the INR on day or day four, day four or day five, and resume the DOAC when it's the INR is less than two. The whole message here is that in most patients, a single blood test, a single INR will suffice. And the second point is that we do not have to do daily or alternate day INR tests to watch that INR level gradually decline before we have confidence in the safety of initiating a DOAC. Next slide. And I want to stress that we're changing patients from warfarin to a DOAC who typically have atrial fibrillation, that's the dominant indication for warfarin therapy, or venous thromboembolism. But as you may know, we do not do this for a patient with a mechanical heart valve, whether aortic or mitral. And there are a number of options that we have in terms of DOACs. On the right-hand side, you see a Thrombosis Canada has a dosing tool for patients with atrial fibrillation that will provide you with dosing options and the actual dose for each DOAC. 
uh, according to the patient characteristics. So we, we have twice daily options with apixaban and the bigotran, and also with rivaroxaban, and this is for patients who are receiving the low dose regimen in concert with an antiplatelet drug for peripheral arterial disease or chronic coronary artery disease. And we also have a one daily option with either adoxaban or rivaroxaban uh, and a lower dose option for rivaroxaban just for patients with venous thromboembolism. So the key message here is that you're gonna to transition to, to the DOAC. There's a tool available that will help you to do so, recognizing there are four different DOACs and there are different dose regimens that should be individualized based on patient characteristics that include things like renal function uh, and age. Uh, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, uh, on behalf of Thrombosis Canada, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's program. Uh, I'd like to express thanks also to Dr. Duquettis and uh, Dr. Uh, Castellucci for their um, excellent presentations and answers to your questions. I also would like to thank our sponsor, Bear Canada, for their unrestricted grant for this program. And be sure to visit our website regularly and often as we add new materials all the time and are always updating our clinical guides and tools. So uh, with that, I wish you all uh, a safe uh, uh, afternoon and safety throughout the rest of uh, COVID. Bye-bye now.